Hi, I'm Katie Miranda, and welcome to the Palestine Solidarity Telesummit. Today, I'm here with Dr. Ramzi Baroud, a U.S. Arab journalist, media consultant, and author, internationally syndicated columnist, editor of the Palestine Chronicle, former managing editor of London-based Middle East Eye, and deputy managing editor of Al Jazeera Online. Ramzi, you are about to embark on a book tour for your new book, The Last Earth, A Palestinian Story. Can you tell us about the book and what cities you're going to visit on your book tour? Um, thank you for having me, Katie. Um, I have, in fact, been on a book tour since February. I have visited uh, eight countries, uh, including New Zealand and Australia, and of course, uh, the UK and throughout the US and Canada, uh, the Netherlands, Austria, and so forth. And um, now I am heading to uh, Brazil very soon, uh, followed by a, a week uh, tour in Hawaii, then back to the UK, Istanbul, Italy, South Africa, Atlanta, San Francisco, and so forth. Uh, and it's very exciting. It's exciting not just because the book is succeeding, uh, and that's always what every author wants, but um, it's it's exciting particularly because of the subject matter of the book. It's uh, The Lost Earth, a Palestinian story, uh, is kind of in a way, you can either think of it as a way to, that, that, uh, uh, a narrative that challenges kind of the, the academic definition of the so-called uh, Arab-Israeli or Palestinian-Israeli conflict, uh, or a way to supplement it. Um, either way, it's, uh, it's, it's an attempt at relocating the center of the conversation from, from the elitist narrative, from the political narrative, from the polarizing me media narrative, and give it back to the people. So it's trying to understand the history of Palestine through what we call people's history or history from below. Uh, it's not uh, mere stories. Uh, it's uh, uh, eight chapters, each representing a story that represents a phenomenon or a generation. Uh, many characters involved in making this book based on numerous hours of interviews over the course of two years. Uh, Palestinians from all over the world participated in this, divided between uh, males and females equally. And it was just an attempt by myself and a few others to try to imagine an answer to the question, if Palestinians, ordinary Palestinians, get the chance to tell their own story, what would the story look like? Will the narrative be partially or fundamentally different from what we know or we think we know about the so-called conflict uh, between Palestine and Israel? And the outcome was really astounding. I mean, it took me by surprise. It uh, not only it, it strengthened my my faith in the in the in the will of the Palestinian people, uh, and and their their collective determination to free themselves uh, from from colonization. But I learned so much that I could have not possibly accessed using traditional historical narrative on wow. Palestine. That's really interesting. Um, I I was struck by one thing you said, retaking the narrative away from the elitist narrative. Like what what is that, and and how is your book different than that? Right. So Palestine, from the very very beginning, uh, kind of really existed um, within the imagination of some other people somewhere else. Uh, the Zionists imagined Palestine uh, to be, you know, the, the land supposedly of their ancestors. They imagined it to be a land that is free of people. It was a land uh, with no, of no people to a people of no land. And, and this idea kind of really um, was the, the foundation upon which the Zionist intrigues and eventually Zionist colonization of Palestine was all about. And until this very moment, 70 years later, despite the fact that the Zionists not only interacted with people who had a culture and rooted in history back to Jericho 
12,000 years ago, they have actually killed these people. They have ethnically cleansed these people. They have colonized and dominated these people, yet they still refuse to recognize them as a people. And I think this is really, really very telling that this is not really about whether the Palestinian people exist as a people or don't exist as a people. It's how we choose to imagine what Palestine and the Palestinians are all about. On the other hand, you have the mainstream narrative uh, of, of Palestine and the Palestinians uh, either as, uh, you know, these a Palestinian as a perpetual terrorist or a perpetual victim. Uh, either way, they are caught in the middle. They are people with no, um, they lack a human agency. Yeah. They are incapable of articulating uh, a, a, a political discourse, needless to say, uh, be self-assertive in any way uh, against all of these forces that are controlling their destiny, whether Israel, the Arabs, the Americans, Palestinian own leadership, Hamas versus Fatah, and so forth. In all of these imagined narratives of Palestine, the Palestinian, the core of that narrative, the core of that history, the essential key to actually unlock our understanding of what is happening in Palestine is marginalized. Uh, and, and this reality is can be stretched in every possible direction. Is taken not just to the media and to the halls of power, but also to academia as well. You are a pro-Palestinian academic, you are an anti-Palestinian ad academic. The reality of what Palestine is kind of in a way disappears. Um, so instead of, you know, it, my book, like few other books that have been coming out recently, it's kind of my way of saying, you know, time out. Let's take a time out from all of this and let's take the recorder and the notebook and the conversation back to the streets of Palestine. Let's to look uh, at the story of Ahmed al-Hajj, the old Palestinian communist, 85 year old, who was pushed out of Palestine at the age of 14, 15, uh, and lives in a refugee camp in Gaza and have been imprisoned by the Israelis, by the Egyptians, and paid a very heavy price for his resistance what is your story? And how does that story of Ahmed al-Hajj overlaps with the story of Omar Wan al-Assar of the Nusayrat refugee camp? And how does it interact or overlaps with the story of Hala Shalabi, the, the longest serving Palestinian hunger striker, in, in uh, a female hunger striker in Israeli jail, or, or Sara Saba in Australia, or the refugee who just escaped Yarmouk looking for a safe place somewhere else, perhaps in Europe, and so forth. So the book was my way of trying, not just reaching out to so-called ordinary Palestinians, but find the overlapping in their narratives, hoping that perhaps at the end, I can achieve a comprehensive, continuous narrative that exists completely outside what they call the elitist narratives of the media, the politicians, and the academia. You mentioned that you found like some really big surprises in your research. Can you give us an example of that? Well, one main issue that I uh, wanted to approach is to answer the question, is there such a thing as a Palestinian identity. We know that there are a Palestinian people because, you know, as the picture behind you, the alienates, there are a Palestinian people. You see Al-Aqsa Mosque, you see uh, the church, you see the symbols of Palestinian Muslims and Christians and even Palestinian Jews who existed in Palestine and identified as Palestinians until Israel was established in 48. Uh, you see history that goes back to hundreds and thousands of years. You see food and music and poetry and so much more. So we know that. As long as there is a culture, a cohesive and concrete culture, there are a people. But then the question is, how do young Palestinians identify, considering that has been that there that, that since then until today, there has been 70 years of exile and political fragmentation and geopolitical fragmentation. A Palestinian who's living in Qatar today, in Saudi Arabia, in Australia, in Argentina, second, third, fourth generation Palestinian who doesn't even speak Arabic, right? Um, 
do they still feel Palestinian? Is there, can we still talk about a unified Palestinian narrative, considering the fact that the Palestinian people, the refugees, all five to seven millions of them, have been located and displaced in numerous different geopolities all around the Middle East and all around the world? How do you create that sense of unified ident identity, unified sense of purpose, unified uh, cultural identifiers where the people themselves are fragmented behind borders, checkpoints, apartheid walls, and so forth and so on? And I really did try to approach this in an objective way because I thought if there is indeed that massive gap in our sense of identity, Palestinians deserve to know it in order for them perhaps to try to do certain things to revive that sense of identity. And I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it, regardless of what language they speak. Hmm. S speaking, for example, to Palestinians in Chile, in Santiago, these are Palestinians who have been, uh, who left Palestine on their own free will seeking economic opportunities uh, in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century before Israel was established. Yet somehow they have this very strong and pronounced, sometimes even slightly exaggerated sense of Palestinian identity. You see it in their football clubs, like the Palestinos, for example. Uh, these Palestinians were in fact uh, stereotyped back in the day as Ottomans or as Turks. Because they lived when Palestine was still under the colonial control of the Ottoman Empire. Yet somehow they still have a very strong and very pronounced sense of Palestinian identity. So for me, the big discovery was, or at least one of them, is that geographic distance does not necessarily, or the gaps in time and geography do not necessarily reflect a lack of identity. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes... Um, you know, I've met I met kids in Gaza and in Ramallah who seemed kind of so disen disenchanted by the politics between Hamas and Fatah, and and they would rather imagine themselves somewhere else doing something entirely different without a very strong tug of identity. While I met people in Australia and in Spain and in Chile who had a very strong sense of rapport. Or, and, and connection to their identity. So that's that's a big discovery for me, that geography is of no essence at all as far as the Palestinian sense of identity is concerned. That's really interesting. Um, so I'm going to move sort of into the kind of topic of this whole telesummit, which is what is working and what's not. So could you tell us, in your opinion, what resistance tactics are working in Palestine in general and people should keep doing them? Meaning, like, what tactics are producing positive results? Now, you can imagine as, as uh, someone who would like to see himself as a people's historian, um, I try as much as um, possible to refrain from offering these kind of grand uh, views. Uh, on, on solutions, for example, I rarely get involved in debates over solutions and, and what form of resistance work and doesn't. But I can tell you this. I can tell you that the true form of resistance is the resistance that is chosen by the people. And that form of resistance is, is often organic and collective. And it happens in its own way based on its own rationale. If I um, tell you, for example, that the first intifada chose the kind of resistance that it did, throwing stones, peaceful resistance, strikes, uh, uh, general strikes, and that sort of things, expressions through arts, and um, it has a lot to do with the time and, and, and place. At the time, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was being pushed out of Lebanon. They are all over the world. The Palestinians felt orphaned. They needed to kind of find what makes them people again. They, they needed to connect across boundaries, the West Bank, Gaza, Palestinians living in, 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 in Israel, and so, and so forth. So the nature of resistance that existed during the first intifada reflected the need for Palestinians to rise as a collective and to create or kind of vow once more to carry on with with uh, uh, with their struggle, with their acts of solidarity 
uh, that expressed in the sense of that collectiveness. In the second Intifada, it was a different story because there was a great deal of weapons in Palestine at the time because of the Palestinian Authority. And many of these fighters could not stand the sight of their people being shot the way that they were shot in the first Intifada. And, and slowly you kind of saw the weapons and the, the Intifada being weaponized. It wasn't a strategic choice. Uh, there, no particular individual in a basement of an, a PLO office decided that the first intifada should express itself this way and the second intifada should express itself this way. It was an organic process. Now, uh, that in mind, it's very clear that Gaza, for example, uh, which really I think that it, it displays resistance in all of its forms more than any other place, at least right now, in all of Palestine. Uh, they embraced armed resistance during the Israeli attacks, during the Israeli wars, because, you know, m mass protests, while Israeli F-15s and 16s are, you know, destroying entire neighborhoods and villages, would have been of no essence whatsoever. So at the time, it seemed like the proper strategy. Um, that said, currently, under the, the current circumstances where there is a need to expose the Israeli siege on Gaza, to, um, to hold the international community accountable to its uh, moral and legal duties in Palestine, you see a different kind of resistance that's happening, the Great March of Return, which in my opinion is kind of a reincarnation of the First Intifada. The community coming together, Hamas and Fatah are not talking to each other, but the Hamas and Fatah supporters, ordinary people are talking to each other at the border. Uh, males and females are taking part in, 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 in dance performances, in art performances, in discussions over books, over strategies and so forth. And they are protesting together and they are helping one another. And in my opinion, this is civil society's way of, of kind of carrying the mantle and expressing itself and, and not necessarily carrying out an act of resistance, but rather trying to figure out how do we resist based on the idea that in order for us to create that form of collective resistance, we have got to get together. We have to have a conversation. So I, I, I explained what's happening in the Great March of Return, not as some Hamas uh, uh, ploy to embarrass Israel in front of the international community and all of this. It's rather a collective Palestinian conversation that we haven't had for such a long time. And we are urgently and desperately in need of having it. And I think that form of resistance works in the sense that uh, it, it, it inspires a conversation outside of Palestine as well. It allows us to see Palestinians as people with a human agency and people who don't need saviors, uh, neither from Europe nor from the US nor from Saudi Arabia or anywhere else. We don't need saviors. We are able to articulate our own political discourse. We are able to pick and choose the form of resistance that works for us at any particular time. And we are willing and prepared to pay a very heavy price for that resistance. So far, over 200, um, 2000, uh, 200 Palestinians have been killed at the border between Gaza and Israel. Uh, uh, nearly 10,000 people have been injured. Uh, nearly 40 children have been killed uh, since March at the border. So it's not that Palestinians are not prepared to pay the heavy price of whatever form of resistance that they do and they choose. Uh, and in fact, that has been the case. And it shows you that the degree of, of, of determination that Palestinians have to defend whatever form of resistance uh, that they choose. And the reason that I am being a little bit, um, maybe a, a bit facetious about this, of why I don't think that it's a good idea to dictate any form of resistance on Palestinians is because since I left Palestine many years ago, I have engaged in many debates and I saw people who have never been to Palestine and people whose understanding of resistance based on, for example, a book they read on Mahatma Gandhi or, or whatever they imagine what happened in South Africa was all about. 
and then they kind of judge Palestinian and push Palestinians to this corner. It's either you resist the way that I think it's proper for you to resist, or somehow I will not support you. You are undeserving of my support. And we forget that um, Algeria fought against uh, uh, French colonialism using all forms of resistance, including armed resistance. South Africa resisted with arms. Even India resisted with arms. Uh, many successful revolutions really had a mix of forms of resistance. Whatever kind of resistance that works for the people, the people decide, the people choose, the people make mistakes and learn from these mistakes. It's nothing that we dictate upon the people from outside. So my next question was going to be like, what tactics are not working in Palestine? But I know you said that basically any tactics that Palestinians choose are tactics that are working. Would you? Right. But, yeah. but I could, in fact, elaborate on that and say, okay. if we are to consider that Mahmoud Abbas and his constant appeal to the United Nations for, you know, allowing Palestine into this UN agency or that UN organization to kind of go back home and celebrate hollow, empty victories about Palestine is is uh, is making the rounds in the international community. Well, no, I don't think that's a successful form of resistance. Okay. I think Mahmoud Abbas should focus most of, if not all of his energy on number one, finding a way to reconcile with his rivals uh, in Palestine itself. Number two, trying to bring his people together in Palestine and outside of Palestine. Number three, he needs to work with the Palestinian street, with Palestinian civil society, to develop uh, a, a national liberation strategy. We are not a state. We can say that um, as loud as we want to. We can declare that in the United Nations a thousand times. We are not a state. We are an occupied nation. Uh, we are fragmented. Our people are all over the world. Our land is occupied. And we do not exist as a state per se. We want to make that happen, perhaps. But, but at the end of the day, we can't just wish for things to happen and pretend that they are happening. You can't allow, you know, you can't just simply say such and such organization admitted Palestine as a state. While on the other hand, you as a Palestinian president, you need to, uh, uh, Leos, you need to coordinate with the Israeli army in order for even. you to actually get out of the West Bank to give a talk in the front of that organization that supposedly admitted you as a state. I, I think it's ridiculous and I think it's laughable. Yeah. I think your message should be to the people. How many times did Mahmoud Abbas speak to the tens of thousands of families, children, women and men at the Gaza border who have been protesting since March 30th? How many times did he address them? with starting with all oh, Palestinians, all oh, my people. How many times did he con condole their martyrs and their losses? How many times? Not once, not once. But he continued on a daily basis to coordinate with the very Israeli army that is controlling the West Bank and oppressing Palestinians. That's not resistance. If he thinks that's a strategy, it's not a strategy. It's a waste of time. What resistance tactics are working coming from the international community? Um, in, in, in three simple initials, BDS. Uh, I have, uh, I left Palestine about 20 years ago. I've been back since then and I've lived uh, many years in the Middle East. And, and all the slogans and all the speeches emanating from Arab capitals have achieved nothing at the end of the day. All the solidarity that is based on, I feel for you, uh, and I will occasionally go downtown and raise a Palestinian flag, and, and then I will eventually go home and feel good about my act. As much as we appreciate the, 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 the symbolism and the gesture, it's really uh, mounted to nil at the end of the day. BDS, which could be discussed and even criticized if there are certain failed tactics or certain energies that are focused on some areas and others. And, but as a platform and as an idea, it's working. It's working in the sense that, number one, it's revitalizing the solidarity of, the, of civil societies around the world. And it's channeling these solidarities towards a very specific 
a, a, a political end. And that political end is that we want to delegitimize Israeli apartheid. We want to hold the Israeli, Israeli government, Israeli leaders, and the Israeli army accountable to its violations of the human rights and to the, the, the illegal military occupation. And we want to push the discussion in every available platform. Academically, we are constantly now, we have been to every major university around the world and we debated and we inserted the Palestinian narrative through BDS worldwide in, 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 in the media, in televisions. But now we are actually making it to various political platforms to uh, uh, European Union platforms, to uh, various governmental platforms in Africa, in Asia, and elsewhere. Of course, we are still being fought so very hard in the United States because you can imagine that the power of Israel and its Zionist lobbies is, is so effective that they have successfully blocked us from some platforms, but in many, many universities, we have eventually gained the upper hand. Um, it's it's the the tangible mechanism of BDS. You support Palestine. I will give you numerous options of how you can actually show your support in a meaningful fashion. And one of, of these meaningful tactics, the very symbolic act of going to a grocery store and looking at an Israeli product and making a conscientious political choice that I will not buy this Israeli hummus, I will not buy this Israeli soda, I will not buy this Israeli whatever product there is. Number one, you showed real solidarity because you actually took the kind of action that when it's multiplied by millions of people, it will be affected and it has been affected. Number two, every single time you go to the store, you are becoming a political agent. You are make, being, uh, making a decision. Then you go on social media and you talk to your friends in the coffee shop in the university and you tell them about your act and you engage them in discussion. So finally, we are able to push Palestine, make Palestine a daily occurrence in the, the, the life of so many people around the world. And that circle is expanding and expanding and expanding. And I have been involved in this for many years. And I tell you, this is absolutely unprecedented. So BDS- The momentum that's, that's happening now, you mean? The, is the momentum is unprecedented, but the, the, the platform itself, prior to BDS, Yes, there has been a lot of solidarity and love and support for Palestine and the Palestinian people and, and, and all of that. But it almost kind of, it was this kind of impulsive, emotional decision that comes out whenever Israel dictates for it to come out. Whenever Israel carries out a massacre, whenever Israel kills a Palestinian child, whenever Israel erases a, a, a village in the West Bank. Uh, we go and we protest and, and, and we show solidarity in that way, but we always felt, but what else can we do? There is so very little follow-ups to that kind of action. BDS has provided us with the tactic and a strategy uh, that, that really is in, enabling us to follow up and to build a, move, a movement with an actual momentum uh, around the world. And I tell you from experience, I have... I have been on several global uh, 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 global speaking tours in the past. My first one was in 2003, after my first book, Searching Janine, came out. Uh, and, and my last tour is what's happening right now. What I have witnessed in my visits, the kind of language that is spoken, the kind of the willpower with the activists, the sense of empowerment. In the beginning, I felt in the first tour that I was isolated. This time, I feel the Zionists are isolated. Hmm. And I think it's just absolutely incredible. The fact that I was allowed to give a talk to the, uh, uh, at the Australian uh, parliament, wow. in which the former foreign minister of Australia was there to present me, this would have been unthinkable at one point in the past. And it's not because of the power of my voice. It's the power of a movement that gave me the platform in which I could convey my voice. And, and that's really the real power of BDS. And if we continue at this rate, and we shall continue at this rate, I think the next generation is going to 
not just discover its in immense power, but could be, in fact, the generation that, that brings that Palestinian South Africa move, uh, movement that we have been coveting for such a long time. That's really inspiring because I know a lot of people get really discouraged in the international community, um, myself included. So knowing that history and being able to compare what it was like on your first book tour versus now is, um, you know, that's really meaningful and, and I hope people don't forget that. What tactics coming from the international community are not working and people should stop doing them? Right. Um, I think any press release issued by any political office anywhere that expresses concern uh, for what Israel is doing in Khan al-Ahmar, for example, <laughs> or even, even uh, strong protest and even condemnation that is not followed by real and serious action, it will not slow down a single Israeli bulldozer. It will not make a single Israeli soldier list trigger happy. It will not change a single Israeli policy. So if we um, have, if we do not formulate strategies that are part of a longer and more cohesive strategies that starts with concern and, and, and go through condemnations and ends up with real solid action, then it's not a strategy. We are just going through the course uh, of, of, of history. We have been doing this for so many years. We expressed concerns when Israel refused to allow Palestinian refugees to return to Palestine in 1948. And we are still expressing concern over uh, the, the American and Israeli attack on UNRWA, the refugee agency that provides education and health care to millions of Palestinian refugees. That doesn't change uh, reality in any way. So, and I would say this applies to any situation, whether it's the, the problem of homelessness in your neighborhood or, or the freedom of the Palestinian people. Just mere expression of concern uh, and, and mere, you know, just seeking, asking for dialogues and just this kind of sentimental, symbolic gestures will not go anywhere. You have to be prepared at one point when all of these strategies fail, that you put actual demands and be prepared and ready to carry out certain actions in order for these demands to be carried out. They apply this in earnest in every possible situation. When an African government is not allowing or not respecting the results of certain elections, um, the European Union, the US, the, the, the various powerful uh, parties, you know, jump on their case and, 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 and make demand. You have got to accept and honor the results of the elections or you shall be boycotted. You shall, you shall be sanctioned, except when it comes to Israel. We always have this, this you know, uh, very soft language, no matter what they do. I mean, think about this. Forget about everything that Israel has done in the last 70 years. Forget about all the massacres, all the killings, all the destruction, all the ethnic cleansing. Just the fact that you have hundreds of snipers as we speak right now, being, you know, uh, 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 sitting in this long line between the fence separating besieged Gaza from Israel, opening fire at children, at nurses, at journalists, at peaceful protesters, shooting them in the head, in the neck, shooting to kill day after day after day, and not one single action meaningful action being carried out by the United Nations or the international community. To the contrary, the action right now is being led by the United States to punish those Palestinians, to punish UNRWA and other agencies that come to their help, to suffocate them even more, to tighten the nose even more. This is the kind of action that is happening. So no, the action of business as usual is not a strategy and it needs to stop. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ramzi. Our time is just about up now. Um, Thank you very much for having me, Katie. Yeah, so if people want to see you on your book tour, how can they find out where you're going to be next? Uh, they can go to my website, uh, ramzibarud.net, uh, or they can um, uh, follow me on my uh, Facebook page, uh, Ramzi M. Baroud. That's my author page, and I 
usually have all the information about all my upcoming tours. Okay, I'm going to put those links in the um, comments below the video. So you guys can just click on that if you want more. So thank you very much, Ramzi. Thank you for having me.